It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. In short, the period was so far like the present period that some of its noisiest authorities insisted on its being received for good or for evil in the superlative degree of comparison only. There was a king with a large jaw and a queen with a plain face on the throne of England. There was a king with a large jaw and a queen with a fair face on the throne of France. In both countries, it was clearer than crystal to the lords of the state, preservers of the loaves and fishes, that things in general were settled forever. It was the year of our Lord, 1775. Spiritual revelations were conceded to England at that favored period, as at this. Mrs. Southcott had recently re attained her five-and-twentieth blessed birthday, of whom a prophetic private in the lifeguards had heralded the sublime appearance by announcing that the arrangements were made for the swallowing up of London and Westminster. Even the Cock Lane ghost had been laid only a round dozen of years after wrapping out its messages as the spirits of this very year last past supernaturally deficient in originality, wrapped out theirs. Mere messages in the earthly order of events had come lately to the English crown and people from a congress of British subjects in America, which, strange to relate, have proved me more important to the human race than any communications yet received through any of the chickens of Cock Lane brood. France less favored on the whole as to matters spiritual than her sister of the shield and trident, rolled with exceeding smoothness down the hill, making paper money and spending it. Under the guidance of her Christian pastors, she entertained herself, besides, with such humane achievements as sentencing a youth to have his hands cut off, his tongue torn out with pinchers, and his body burned alive because he had not kneeled down in the rain to do honor to a dirty procession of monks, which passed within his view at a distance of some fifty or sixty yards. It is likely enough that rooted in the woods of France and Norway, there are growing trees when that sufferer was put to death, already marked by the woodman, fate, to come down and be sawn into boards, to make a certain movable framework with a sack and a knife, in it terrible in history. It is likely enough that in the rough outhouses of some tillers of the heavy lands adjacent to Paris, there were sheltered from the weather that very day rude carts, bespattered with rustic mire, snuffed about by pigs, and roosted in by poultry, which the farmer, death, had already set apart to be his tumbrils of the revolution. But that woodman and that farmer, though they work unceasingly, work silently, and no one ever heard them as they went about with muffled tread, the rather for us so much to entertain any suspicion that they were awake was to be atheistical and traitorous. In England, there was scarcely an amount of order and protection to justify much national boasting. Daring burglaries by armed men and highway robberies took place in the capital itself every night. Families were publicly cautioned not to go out of town without removing their furniture to upholsterer's warehouse for security. The highwayman in the dark was a city tradesman in the light, and being recognized and challenged by his fellow tradesmen, whom he stopped in his character of the captain, gallantly shot through him the head and shot him through the head and rode away. 
The mail was waylaid by seven robbers, and the guard shot three dead, and then got shot dead himself by the other four, in consequence of the failure of his ammunition. After which, the mail was robbed in peace. That magnificent potentate, the Lord Mayor of London, was made to stand and deliver on Turnham Green by one highwayman, who despoiled the illustrious creature in sight of all his retinue. Prisoners in London gals fought battles with their turnkeys, and the majesty of the law fired blunderbusses in among them, loaded with rounds of shot and ball. Thieves snipped off diamond crosses from the necks of noble lords at court drawing rooms. Musketeers went into St. Giles to search for contraband goods, and the mob fired on the musketeers and the musketeers fired on the mob. And nobody thought anything of these occurrences much out of the common way. In the midst of them, the hangman, ever busy and ever worse than useless, was in constant requisition, now stringing up long rows of miscellaneous criminals, now hanging a housebreaker on Saturday who had never been taken on Tuesday, now burning people in the hand at Newgate by the dozen, and now burning pamphlets at the door of Westminster Hall, today taking the life of an atrocious murderer, and tomorrow of a wretched pilferer who had robbed a farmer's boy of sixpence. All these things, and a thousand like them, came to pass in and close upon the dear old year 1,775, envisioned by them while the woodman and the farmer worked unheeded, those two of the large jaws, and those other two of the plain and fair faces, trod with stir enough, and carried their divine rights with a high band, with a high hand. Thus, did the year 1,775 conduct their greatnesses, and myriads of small creatures, the creatures of this chronicle among the rest, along the roads that lay before them. What good luck is that, huh? A Tale of Two Cities, Charles Dickens, happens to refer to the mail. Even the second chapter right here, which, uh, bless you, I'm not going to read, is entitled The Mail. <laughs> the chapter itself starts out with the word, the mail. And it was interesting to hear him describe how they were finally able to rob the mail in peace after they shot a couple of people, and how much crime there was in London town, the capital of England, whatever they called it then. Gallantly shot through the head and rode away. The mail was waylaid by seven robbers, and the guard shot three dead, and then got shot himself by the other four, in consequence of the failure of his ammunition, after which the mail was robbed in peace. Good morning, Bitcoins! Today is Monday, August 24th, 2020, and we're watching the country burn figuratively and literally. Out here in California, we have actual fires. So at first, you couldn't go outside, and you couldn't be near people, and you couldn't go to movie theaters, and you couldn't go to bars, and you couldn't go anywhere. And now, you don't even want to, because <laughs> there's smoke everywhere, and you're coughing all the time. And you don't know why. It's 
Like everyone, everyone in the state has suddenly started smoking two to three packs a day for no good reason. But yes, while California is only literally on fire, it's Washington, D.C., where we look for today's actual fire. And I didn't think they'd do it. You know, they've done a lot of things, and it's been quite amazing to see them do it and to watch it in our lifetime. So many things that you thought would never be done suddenly being done. But to destroy the whole post office just to win an election and end a democracy and end the whole country, I I think it's the one. I think this is the beautiful Roman Empire moment that people are going to look back on and they're going to be like, those ignorant citizens of the United States had no idea that their democracy was being destroyed from the inside by the destruction of the post office. And they'll, they'll describe this event today and they'll say, the Democratic Congress vague, vainly tried to save the post office. They made amazing speeches and words that all did nothing. The postmaster general had decided to lie. It didn't much matter. So lie he did. And as it is with YouTube, we've got clips. But first, Windows 95 is 25 years old today. Oh, I feel so old. I'm a thousand years old. Uh, how old am I? Let's, well, let's find out. I had an early version of Windows 95 on floppy disk back when it was called Chicago. And when I say on floppy disk and you say, no, Windows, it came on CD. That's a, that's a big software. No, I had about 25 to 35 floppy disks of Windows 95, a.k.a. Chicago. Much cooler name, really. And I installed it on my computer. <laughs> I installed it on my uh, DOS and Windows 3.1 computer. Uh, if one of those disks had been bad during the installation process, which was a very good possibility with floppy disks, actual, I mean, they're inside a little hard case, but the inside disk was just floppy, like film. I don't know, you don't know what film is either, but <clears throat> it was like a negative, and the data had been written on there. And if one of those files had been bad, I wouldn't have been able to try the early beta of Windows 95. So you got to take risks back in the DOS days. You didn't have any backups. You didn't have any backup hard drives. You didn't have any USB drives. You just went ahead and reinstalled the operating system, just hoping that everything would be fine. And it usually was. Shout out to Starduster in the chat. He's saying this: the CD for Windows 95 had the Weezer clip, the uh, Buddy Holly Weezer music video. You could watch the whole thing on your computer, which was revolutionary at the time. It was unbelievable, and it was actually really decent quality. It was a pretty large video uh, of the Weezer. Uh, in celebration of Windows 95 Day, we want to get you a blast from the past from Jason Scott at textfiles.com. He's working over at the Internet Archive, and he wants to remind you that the Internet Archive is hosting 65,000 Winamp skins, and they have a JavaScript-based Winamp emulator called WebAmp that will create a working Winamp in the browser. So if any of you are early MP3 people on Windows, you'll know what this sounds like. The rest of you, maybe it's your first time, but this is Winamp. Win -app. Win -app. It really whips the llama's ass. <laughs> I don't care if I lose my uh, ad rights for that. It's worth it. But yes, he did say Winamp really whips the llama's ass. And this was the first uh, audio file on every version of Winamp. If you pushed play without putting some music in, it would play that. <laughs> so pretty cool. And now the horrors. Uh, take it away, Representative Lynch from the House of Representatives. Just so happens I was elected on 9-11, the day of the terrorist attacks on our nation, a god-awful day. Some people forget, in the days after 9-11, we had direct anthrax attacks on the United States Postal Service. We lost two brave postal workers, Joseph Kersine and Tom Morris, down at the Brentwood facility here in D.C. from anthrax inhalation. But for the good of the country, 
The postal unions continue to send their members into the post office to do their job to keep the country running. So two, two weeks ago, after you'd been postmaster just for just a few weeks, that all changed. In the middle of a pandemic that has killed 170,000 Americans, and on the eve of a national election, at a time when the CDC is advising people not to gather, limit outside contact, the Postal Service started removing 671 high-speed mail sorting machines across the country. You stopped the APWU from sorting the mail, and you stopped the national letter carriers and mail handlers from working overtime to deliver the mail. And for the first time in 240 years in our history of the United States Postal Service, you sent out a letter embarrassingly to, in July to 46 states that said the post office can't guarantee that we can deliver the mail in time for the elections in November. And we have reports from across the country, as you acknowledge, service has been delayed and the mail is piling up. You have ended a once proud tradition. Now, as a member of the Oversight Committee, we are the chief investigative committee in the Congress. We conduct oversight on every matter that impacts the American people, foreign and domestic. There are members on this committee who have been to Iraq and Afghanistan a couple dozen times. They've been to Yemen, Somalia, Gaza, you name it. They literally go to the ends of the earth to investigate matters that affect the American people, especially when it involves our sons and daughters in uniform. In this moment, it is our postal workers who happen to be our men and women in uniform. They are on the front lines of this pandemic. Throughout this pandemic, they've risked their own health and safety to deliver, or try to deliver, mail medicines and mail-in ballots to every American home and business six days a week. As a member of this August committee, I'm supposed to ask you a question. In my heart, I'm tempted to ask, after 240 years of patriotic service delivering the mail, how can one person screw this up in just a few weeks? Now, I understand you bring private sector expertise. I guess we couldn't find a government worker who could screw it up this fast. It would take them a while. The president is running this post office like a business, like he said. He's running it into the ground, as he has declared bankruptcy a few times on his own businesses. In an effort to apply the facts, the real facts, not the, not the alternative facts, based on what you have actually done, one can only reach, as a fact finder, we can only reach two conclusions. One, either through gross incompetence, you have ended the 240-year history of delivering the mail reliably on time, or the second conclusion that we could gather is that you're doing this on purpose and that you're deliberately dismantling this once proud tradition. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman may answer his question. My, my last thank question is this. Thank you, what sir. What the heck are you doing? Thank what you, the sir. heck are the you doing? The gentleman's time has expired. Over. Thank you, sir. The gentleman's uh, time has expired. The gentleman first may answer. First of all, I, I would like to uh, uh, agree with you on the heroic efforts of our 650,000 uh, 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 um, employees across the nation and the history of the Postal Service for their uh, 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 the 250-year uh, hi history of serving the American the American public, and I'm very Will you proud. Put the machines I'm very back? I'm very proud to lead the organization. The rest of your accusations are actually will you put the will you put the high-speed machines no, back? No, I will not. You will not. Will not. You will not. Well, there you go. There I go. Watch there those machines. Well, there you go. There you go. He won't put the machines back. Listen to how petulant he was. No, no, I will not. Like, he's guaranteed he wants to fix the election. He's going to do it. And they're, and then, I can't believe they're doing it. They're, they're doing it to all their people. Uh, they're destroying all the seniors who get their medicine via the mail, all the businesses that use the mail, all the rural areas. Remember, this is the postal service. Uh, they don't like to say that. They'd rather say post office or something, like it's a business. It's a service. It's a service that provides mail to places where it's not worth delivering other packages. It's the last mile. That's why a lot of times you'll see a package come in and UPS takes it all over the world. Then when they get to the last mile, they give it to the postman and he brings it the rest of the way. It's not supposed to be profitable. It's supposed to be a service, right? And of course, anyone that's been paying attention to politics for any amount of time knows that they purposely crippled the post office uh, back in, I want to say, the 90s when they made the post office pay up front for their health care. Uh, what the post office have to do, they have to have their liabilities cleared for like the next 25 years. 
So they have a debt on their books for 25 years of health care. That's why this Republican talking point always comes up that the post office is losing money or the post office is running at a deficit. That's something that they changed specifically to punish them, to make them look bad, to set up this destruction scenario that we're in now. They set them up by making them have to pay in advance their liability for insurance. But we've got more. Let's check out uh, the next representative here. Representative Mr. Jim DeJoy, Cooper. here's what your so-called reforms have done to my district in 70 days. A lady named Elena Roser paid $5 on July 22nd to send a certified letter to the Nashville, Tennessee Social Security Office. The distance is 20 miles. The letter took 12 days to arrive. Just this morning, excellent reporting from Nashville's Channel 5 TV proves that Nashville's mail trucks are being forced to leave on schedule even when completely empty. Imagine it, 53-foot trucks forced to travel hundreds of miles completely empty due to your so-called reforms. Here are the truck records. That's not efficiency, that's insanity. For anyone thinking of voting absentee, Oh, well, I hate to interrupt the representative here. It's important to keep in mind the talking point that he's defending here. Uh, later on, DeJoy will say things like, all I did was say that the truck should run on time. You would think that saying the trucks would run on time would increase the delivery, right? But it, it's really obvious, even without any information, how you would look at that statement. And it's clearly you could punch holes through it. The clear one there is, <clears throat> let's say there's extra mail in the office. Well, if the trucks are running on time, they have to stop exactly at 5 o'clock. Extra mail, stop at 5 o'clock. But now we're seeing that it's much, much worse now that we're given some information and some evidence here from Representative Jim Cooper. Now we're learning that if the trucks are empty in the morning, they're making the empty trucks leave the lot, drive their route, come back, in the name of efficiency, because it's defendable, right? A lot of people compared it with the Mussolini trains on time, but it's not really the same. It's much more insidious. He's saying something that sounds right. Oh, I'm just making everyone work a nine to five, you know? I thought that would work. But they've had all these policies in the past about the post office, about always delivering the mail, about going the extra mile, doing the overtime. And it's so funny, on one side... You have all these police getting tons and tons of overtime uh, to clear the seat streets, to hurt the protesters, to attack them with weapons and stomp them and so on and so forth. And then on the other side, we have these postal, member, postal service members who are going out into the streets, delivering mail, probably at more risk uh, to virus in a lot of cases. And we can't pay them overtime. It's really neat the way that we've decided at this point in time, no more postal overtime Police and fire overtime, okay. It's really short-sighted and an amazing decision. This is going to come back in history. Everyone's going to look at this and they're all going to say, how did the U.S. allow them to take the post office? They're, they're going to have all these examples and all the logos and the hundreds of years and all the mail, and they're going to be, why did you guys allow them? Why did you just stand there and do nothing? And the insidious way that this happens is it creeps, right? It starts out, DeJoy's appointed postmaster general. And I remember that. I remember everyone being up in arms. And it was kind of a mirror image of the uh, attorney general bar hearings where they made him say a bunch of things like, oh, you're not going to mess up the mail for the president, are you? And, and he said, oh, of course not. I take this seriously, just like Barr did. Because it doesn't matter if you lie under oath. It doesn't matter if you lie to Congress if your plan at the end of the day is just to be pardoned. If your plan is to just overthrow the system, uh, you just go for it, right? It's an all or nothing game and you just put all of your old morals and your old things aside and you just go for that win. And if you win, you win big. If you lose, you know, you end up in jail like all the other people who worked with the president. Uh, but let's go back to Representative Jim Cooper talking to Postmaster, Postmaster General DeJoy. The effect of your policies is to unilaterally move up Election Day from November 3rd 
to something like October 27th. And if you force more empty trucks on the highway, you will be able to single-handedly move up Election Day even earlier. According to NPR, already 550,000 primary ballots, absentee ballots, were rejected in just 30 states. And one of the main reasons was late delivery. How dare you disenfranchise so many voters when you told the Senate committee just last week that you had a sacred duty to protect election mail? You know that it's a felony for a Postal Service officer or employee to delay delivery of mail. A postal employee can be fined or imprisoned for up to five years for delaying the mail, but somehow you can delay all the mail and get away with it. They can be prosecuted, but you can't, even if your actions are a million times worse. Mr. DeJoy, do you have a duty to obey U.S. law like every other American? I do, sir. Well, previous postmasters general have been punished for much smaller conflicts of interest than yours. In 1997, the 70th Postmaster General, Marvin Runyon from Tennessee, had to pay $27,000 because of a $350,000 conflict of interest. If your $30 million conflict of interest, 100 times larger than Mr. Runyon's, were treated like your predecessors, you would have to pay a $2.7 million fine and probably be ousted from being Postmaster General. So, Mr. DeJoy, are you above the law that applies to other Postmasters General? Um, I, I don't agree with the premise. I'm full, in full compliance with all. Now, you see, this is a really telling point where DeJoy has the chance to say, no, I'm not above the law. That's what anyone else would say. You'd answer the representative's question. Look at how DeJoy dodges and gets upset. This is a classic response when you're questioned and you're in trouble. You dodge, you get upset. Uh, I'm reminded now, it's funny, it's the, uh, the Mighty Ducks movie that Brock was in. And uh, it's so funny, they're training them how to fake fight. And he says, fall on the ice, get indignant, get ejected. And this is a classic, like, he's a lawyer, and he's teaching these kids how to fake hockey fights and how to fake hockey injuries and how to get the other person uh, screwed over for a penalty. And it's shown in the movie uh, to be a bad thing, that the lawyer learns the spirit of teamwork and so on and so forth. He learns through this. But DeJoy has clearly not. He's betting it all right now. He's got a potential $3 million fine. Things are getting very serious. You can see how nervous he is. He's blinking like crazy. And he's looking up into the left. That's a classic. He's thinking about how to lie. Let's go back and let's hear his incredible answer to, is he above the law? Paul? Um, I, I, I don't agree with the premise. Uh, uh, I, 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 I. Um, I, I don't agree with the premise. I'm full, in full compliance with all ethical requirements uh, that, that I need to have. And there's an OIG investigation, and I welcome the result of that report. Well, Mr. DeJoy, as a mega donor for the Trump campaign, you were picked along with Michael Cohen and Elliot Broiding, two men who have already pled guilty to felonies, to be the three deputy finance chairman of the Republican National Committee. Did you pay back several of your top executives for contributing to Trump's campaign by bonusing or rewarding them? That's an outrageous claim, sir, and I resent it. I'm just asking a question. The answer is no. So you did not bonus or reward any of your executives? No. no. Anyone that you solicited for a contribution to the Trump campaign? No, sir. Not in whole or in part? To, to be, uh, uh, actually, I, uh, during the Trump campaign, I wasn't even working at my company anymore. Well, we want to make sure that campaign contributions well, are legal. So all your campaign I'm contributions fully aware are legal. Of what, I'm fully aware of ca legal, legal contrain, campaign contributions. So that was not a denial there about the campaign contributions, the fact that he was no longer working at the firm. That was a red herring. He's just attempting to deject the question. Uh, it's very clear here. It seems like Representative Jim Cooper is a former attorney. 
and that he's setting this up for the next trial. The questions that he's asking DeJoy here about the campaign finance contributions are definitely going to be replayed in a later trial, and they're going to have evidence, so it's going to change things. But we have to wait. We have to wait till later. Well, what if and I resent the assertion, sir. What well, are you accusing me of? Well, I'm asking a question. Do your mail delays fit Trump's campaign goal of hurting the post office, as stated in his tweets? I'm Are not, your mail I'm delays not, implicit gonna, campaign I'm not contributions? These types of questions. I'm here. I'm here to represent the postal service. It has nothing to do with. All my actions have to do with improvement into the postal service. May this. Am I the only one in this room that understands that we have a ten billion dollar a year loss? Right. Am I the only will, one in this room? Will you that has give this committee? OIG reports will you give this committee up? your communications with Mark Meadows, with Treasury Secretary Mnuchin, Go with ahead the and president? Do that. Mr. DeJoy, is your backup plan to be pardoned like Roger Stone? Oh, God. <laughs> Pitiful. You have two seconds to answer the question. I have no comment on that. It's not I worth see my comment. time has expired. Gentlemen's not time worth the comment. Expired, uh, Representative, the gentleman from. So there you go, a little preview of the future. Uh, DeJoy to be pardoned just like Roger Stone. Uh, he's it's so funny now. Uh, but it won't be so funny later. You note that he didn't say no, and you'll note that he didn't say, I wouldn't accept a pardon. I've done nothing wrong. He laughed at it. So once again, these are previews of the future, the future DeJoy trials, after he's wrecked the post office. Remember, all of this doesn't really matter. The post office will be wrecked. The mail-in ballots will be wrecked. And mainly what you're looking for there. And you have to go back to Wag the Dog for this. Everyone needs to be up on their political movies. You need to watch Wag the Dog. And you need to realize how the game is played. All you need to do is delay. The president's going to claim victory on the first day. And then he's got to delay the counting or delay the verification of the ballots. So slowing down the mail service is the perfect addition to the delay. And then you just claim, you know, oh, all the ballots are bad. Everything's bad. You just stall, stall, delay, stall, just like they did in the Florida 2000 election when they had the Brooks Brothers riot and they stormed the counting room and they wouldn't let them count the ballots. Stopping that count in Florida led to the Supreme Court to say, well, you stopped once. I guess you don't have to count anymore. Whereas if they had continued counting, Al Gore would have won the election. So we've been through this before. We're going through it now in slow motion. It's bigger than it's ever been. But yes, they're absolutely going to destroy the post office. They'll stop at nothing. It's pretty impressive. Like it used to be just a conspiracy theory or whatever, but now we've got the man himself, DeJoy, throwing it down as well as the president in tweets and uh, in speeches uh, saying that he does not want the mail to work. He does not want mail-in ballots to work. Here's Debbie Washerman Schultz. No, you... Mr. DeJoy... The culture and ethos of the U.S. Postal Service is every piece, every day. I've been in briefings with Florida's local Postal Service employees who were telling me that since your arrival, this is no longer the mission of the USPS. Overtime to finish delivering mail is not allowed, and piles upon piles of backlog mail are being left undelivered. Sorting machines are being sold for scrap or unplugged and ro roped off. My first question is, is it still the policy and goal of the USPS to deliver every piece every day, or have you eliminated or changed that in any way? Uh, first of all, that is misrepresentation of any action that I have taken. But yes, the goal is to get to deliver every piece every day. And ma'am, we were not doing that before I got here. And my okay. goal is to- Well, it's, it's gotten, reclaiming my time, it has clearly gotten worse since your arrival. Uh, we have piles upon piles of mail that, as a result of the changes that you've made, appear to have delayed the mail even further than you, supposedly they were delayed previously. Change. You're, no. The change I've made. Well, the changes that you've made. Change. I made one change. Well, I'm sorry. You've made far more than one change. That's not true. You're, okay. Reclaiming my time. You're not being honest with this committee. That's not true. I am being okay. honest. Okay. Uh, I would ask that the chair add time back and direct a witness not to interrupt me. Madam Chair. Mr. De Mr. DeJoy. Let's I'm allow sorry. the witness Re to answer the questions and the false my, accusations. Reclaiming my time. I did not interrupt any other member while they were talking and I expect not to be interrupted. The time is mine. 
Mr. DeJoy, you are not being honest without, about with the committee about removing the sorting machines. We have been asking you for details for weeks, and you have been hiding them from us with, while removing them at a breakneck pace. On August 4th, your staff gave this committee a briefing on this issue, and all they told us was that you'd be mo moving machines around to where they were needed most. We have the slides from that briefing. There was no mention of taking any sorting machines offline. On August 11th, your general counsel responded to our requests for more information with no mention of taking any sorting machines offline. Your culture of misinformation has even trickled down to Florida postal leadership. On August 14th, my office asked whether sorting machines were being removed at the Royal Palm facility, which covers all of South Florida, and were assured the capacity was actually being expanded. But it was only after I spoke with local postal workers that I was told about the FSS machine in Royal Palm, which had been shut down and roped off since July. Press outlets finally revealed the internal plan to remove more than 600 plus sorting machines. You were not transparent. We had to get it from news reports. I want to take this opportunity to enter into the record, Madam Chair, an August 18, 2020 email from USPS Director of Maintenance Operations, Kevin Couch. <clears throat> Madam Chair. The email reads, please message out to your respective maintenance managers tonight. They are not to reconnect, reinstall machines that have been previously been disconnected without approval from headquarters maintenance, no matter what direction they are getting from their plant manager. Mr. DeJoy, yes or no, and you've indicated in this committee hearing that it's not your job to decide about whether sorting machines are on or offline, but at the same time you told Mr. Khanna that you won't bring them online because they're not needed. So yes or no, have any plant managers requested mail sorting machines be reconnected? First of all, yes I, or no. I, I, I disagree with the premise. I'm not asking you anything other than reclaiming my said. time, Madam Chair. Yeah, reclaiming yes their or time. no. Yes or no answer. Yes or no. Have any plant managers across the country in the U.S. put PS requested mail sorting machines be reconnected? How would I, I how would I know that? You're in charge. You don't know whether there are there are plant managers that have requested. Well, let me no, just I, I let me just know. assure you that there are plant managers that was reported in the in the press. In, in both Washington, I, I, it, there are plant managers in Texas and Washington, and I have articles to, that I can show you that have asked to have sorting machines reconnected and brought back online, and they've been too scared to come forward to say so. So you've, you've indicated that it's local leadership. In this hearing, I heard you say it's not your job to decide whether yeah. sorting machines are brought online or not. Uh, someone needs to mute, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, please, some, please mute, mute uh, people that are listening. Please mute. I probably I, I need probably about additional 30 seconds from the interruptions added back onto my time, please. You have said in this hearing it's both not your job to make decisions about sorting machines, and at the same time you've said that you're not going to bring them back online because they're not needed. It can't be both. So. Uh, my, lo my local bar barcode, my local handlers who work with sorting machines regularly and this specific barcode sorter machine have assured me that it would not be difficult to plug it back in. How difficult would it be to reconnect machines that haven't already been destroyed? For example, on display, uh, if we can bring that up on the screen, I was sent a photo from a processing and distribution center in Florida where the power cord is hanging from the ceiling and not plugged in. And my local handlers tell me that with sorting machines regularly, and that, hand, that specific machine specifically, that it would not be difficult to plug back in. Do you believe that it is the local handler's job to decide whether they need a sorting machine? And will you give them the freedom to plug the machines back in and bring machines that haven't been taken apart back online in order to make sure we can get the mail out on time, which you acknowledge has gotten worse since your arrival? The gentlewoman's time has expired, but the gentleman is requested no. to answer a question. That, that was a long list of uh, accusations. Uh, no, I just want a simple not, answer to the not, question about whether well, you will give. it's my time now? Is it my time? No, no, it's always to... my time. And no. I'd like an answer to the question. Her time has expired. I'm sorry. Never... I'd like an answer to the question whether or not we, you will We have leave a management it... team, that, the management team that is responsible for making decisions as to what, what, what machines are used or, and not used. Okay? But those so, things are decided locally. The Will you let them expired. decide expired. that locally? The time is expired. Yes or no? Will you let them decide Time's that expired. locally? No. Uh, okay. Congressman well, then Higgins, you, you are now then you have not told us the truth in this hearing, and it is Time your is fault expired, that the mail Madam has Chair, been laid. Her time is expired. Your fault. Her time is expired. On you, and you've acknowledged that. Her time is expired. Her time has expired. response in writing. Explosive hearing there. 
It's your fault that the mail's been delayed. And again, listen to his answer when he finally comes down to the truth. No, I will not plug back in the machines. I've been assigned to fix the election, and the election is what I'm going to fix. Powerful stuff from Postmaster to Joy. Of course, as you guys all know, the Post Office, also known as the United States Postal Service, traces its roots back to 1775 during the Second Continental Congress when Benjamin Franklin was appointed the first Postmaster General. The Post Office Department was created in 1792 with the package of the passage of the Postal Service Act. It was elevated to a cabinet-level department in 1872 and was transformed by the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970s into the United States Postal Service as an independent agency. Since the early 1980s, many direct tax subsidies to the USPS have been reduced or eliminated. The Postal Clause in the Constitution, <clears throat> Article 1, Section 8, Clause 7, gives empowers Congress to establish post offices and post roads. The post office has the constitutional authority to designate mail routes. The post office is also empowered to construct or designate post offices with the implied authority to carry, deliver, and regulate the mail of the United States as a whole. The postal power also includes the power to designate certain materials as non-mailable and to pass statutes criminalizing abuses of the postal system, such as mail fraud and armed robbery of post office buildings. The Pony Express was one of the most historic chapters of the United States Post Office before its destruction in 2020, the Pony Express was a mail service delivering messages, newspapers, and mail using relays of horse-mounted riders that operated from April 3, 1860 to October 24, 1861 between Missouri and California in the United States of America. Operated by Central Overland California and Pikes Peaks Express Company, the Pony Express was a great financial investment to the United States. During its 18 months of operation, it reduced the time for messages to travel between the Atlantic and Pacific coasts to about 10 days. Many people used the Pony Express as a communications link. It also encouraged catalogs to be created, allowing people to buy goods and have them brought by horse to the consumers. It became the West's most direct means of East-West communication before the Transcontinental Telegraph was established, October 24, 1861, and was vital for tying the new United State of California in with the rest of the United States. The Postal Service Creed is Neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. You can see it there on the side of the James Farley Post Office, presumably in Washington, D.C. Feels like we're on a roller coaster, right? And we're just getting up near the top. And we're going to go over the other side, and we're going to find out. We're going to find out what happens with our roller coaster? And it's clear we're not going to have the Postal Service with us. It's clear that ballots are going to be late. Election day is going to be election week. And that's only the beginning of our American nightmare. The weeks between the election and the inauguration will be the most interesting days in American history that we've ever lived through. More interesting than the collapse of the Berlin Wall happening suddenly in 1991. Surprise. More interesting than the morning of 9-11, watching New York being destroyed on television, live. More interesting than the 2000 election, when the Brooks Brothers riot allowed W. Bush to stop the counting of votes, winning the election over Al Gore because they didn't count the votes. 
Yes, the most interesting time in America is coming up. Quick preview. The Reichstag Fire Decree is the common name for the decree of Reich President for the protection of people and state. In German, Verandung des Reichspräsidenti zum Schutz von Volk und Staat. Issued by German President Paul von Hindenburg on the advice of Chancellor Adolf Hitler on the 28th of February 1933, in immediate response to the Reichstag fire. The decree nullified many of the key civil liberties of German citizens. With Nazis in powerful positions in the German government, the decree was used as the legal basis for the imprisonment of anyone considered to be opponents of the Nazis and to suppress publications not considered friendly to the Nazi cause. The decree is considered by historians as one of the key steps in the establishment of a one-party Nazi state in Germany. And remember also before that, just a few years before, in 1923, the Beer Hall Putz was a failed coup d'etat by the Nazi party leader Adolf Hitler, along with General Quartermeister Erich Ludendorff and other Kampfbund leaders, to seize power in Munich, Bavaria, which took place on the 8th and 9th of November, 1923. Approximately 2,000 Nazis were marching to the Federn Hall in the city center when they were confronted by a police cordon, which resulted in the deaths of 16 Nazi party members and four police officers. Hitler, who was wounded during the clash, escaped immediate arrest and was spirited off to safety in the countryside. After two days, he was arrested and charged with treason. The Putz brought Hitler to the attention of the German nation and generated front-page headlines in newspapers around the world. His arrest was followed by a 24-day trial, which was widely publicized and gave him a platform to express his nationalist sentiments to the nation. Hitler was found guilty of treason and sentenced to five years in Landsberg prison, where he dictated Mein Kampf to his fellow prisoners Emil Maurice and Rudolf Hess. On 20th December 20, 1924, having served only nine months, Hitler was released. Once released, Hitler redirected his focus towards obtaining power through legal means rather than revolution or force, and accordingly changed his tactics, further developing Nazi propaganda. Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder treason and plot. I can think of no reason that the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. First, they came for the postman. Today is Monday, August 24th, 2020. Stay safe. Until next time. Bye-bye.